Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. Wuhan's Institute of Virology is researching yet another deadly virus. This one comes from the Xinjiang region and may wreak even more havoc in the body. One man in Hong Kong dies after receiving the CCP virus vaccine. The dose given to him was made in China. A new round of digital security breaches blamed on Chinese hackers. Both the U.S. and India have been targeted. U.S. health authorities reportedly complied with a confidentiality form designed by the Chinese Communist Party. That's in order to access data collected by the World Health Organization. And does China ever have free speech? Contrary to the CCP's crackdown on dissidents, the right to criticize the government is actually rooted in ancient Chinese culture. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Wuhan's Controversial Virology Institute is doing research on another virus. And this one could be even more deadly than the CCP or Chinese Communist Party virus. It's called the Ebener Lake virus. The new infection doesn't come from bats or seafood like the CCP virus is thought to. Instead, it's mainly transmitted through mosquitoes or ticks. The research paper was published in Frontiers in Microbiology magazine last month. To conduct the research, Wuhan's Virology Institute worked with two other Chinese institutions. One of them is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the Xinjiang region, the same area that the Uyghur ethnic minority calls home. This virus got its name from the area where it was first found, the Ebener Lake area in Xinjiang region. It was isolated from a certain type of mosquito there. This is the first time the Ebener Lake virus has been studied, though it had previously been found in nature. The Virology Institute study sheds light on how it functions. Scientists there discover that mice are easily infected by the virus and died within five to nine days of catching it. The new virus also caused problems almost everywhere in the body. The infected mice lost weight and showed mild symptoms of brain swelling. The virus also attacked the rodent's central nervous system, blood, liver, spleen and other areas. The research triggered heated discussion among Chinese netizens. Someone from Wuhan commented, quote, I beg the Wuhan Research Institute to move away. Another city, please kindly accept it. Seeing this report really scared the heck out of me. Another netizen urged other countries to get prepared, warning all countries should quickly develop vaccines. An elderly man in Hong Kong died two days after he received a Chinese-made CCP virus vaccine. The Hong Kong government reported this on Tuesday. The Hong Kong government started vaccination for priority groups, including people over 60, since last Friday. According to local media, the Apple Daily, the 63-year-old man had diabetes and received Chinese-made Sinovac vaccine on the first day. He then developed acute breathing difficulties and died two days later. According to media reports, Sinovac vaccine has a 50 percent effective rate, and suspected side effects are reported worldwide, including death. Hong Kong health officials issued a statement saying the man's death is still under investigation. They said, quote, at the moment, the causal relationship with the vaccination could not be ascertained. Possible side effects linked to China's version of the CCP virus vaccine. That's according to one couple in Beijing who recently received doses. Chinese authorities deny that Chinese vaccines pose any serious side effects. Chinese media outlets have also avoided the issue. But a social media post from one Beijing resident early this week seems to tell a different story. Ms. Zhang explained that she and her husband received the first shot of the vaccine about two weeks ago. Everything started out normally. But about a week later, her husband started to develop small red rashes all over his body, along with various aches and itches. He later started to run a fever, which lasted for several days, hitting a high of 101 degrees. He was also unable to sleep. Zhang also pointed out that her husband has no known allergies and rarely gets sick. After going to the hospital, her husband had a number of tests done, including blood tests, CT tests, virus tests, and biochemical tests. All test results came back normal, and he tested negative for the CCP virus. 
doctors refused to rule out some sort of allergic reaction. Ms. Jung said while in the hospital, she noticed another young man with similar symptoms to her husband. But he looked even worse. She later found out the man has also received a dose of the same vaccine. She reported her husband's case to the hospital, but officials there said they'd have to wait until her husband recovered if they wanted to investigate. Ms. Sung questioned how it would be possible to prove whether or not her husband had an allergic reaction to the vaccine after he already recovered from it. Ms. Zhang later told Hong Kong's Apple Daily newspaper that the vaccine her husband received was made by China's Sinopharm Pharmaceutical Company. A Chinese regime-backed hacking group targeted two Indian vaccine makers that develop CCP virus vaccines. This according to Singapore and Japan-based cybersecurity company Cypherma. Bharat Biotech and the Serum Institute of India are the world's largest vaccine makers. India is also Communist China's rival in vaccine making. It produces more than 60 percent of all vaccines sold in the world. Cypherma says Chinese hacking group APT10 identified gaps and vulnerabilities in the IT infrastructure and supply chain software of the two Indian companies. The hacking group is also known as Stone Panda. Cypherma's chief executive used to be a top cyber official with British Foreign Intelligence Agency MI6. He says the Chinese regime's real motive is to exfiltrate intellectual property and to get competitive advantage over India. He says Stone Panda was actively targeting Serum Institute of India because it is making the AstraZeneca vaccines for many countries and will soon start bulk production of Novavax shots. The Chinese regime's foreign ministry has yet to comment. Another wave of data theft blamed on Chinese hackers. Microsoft said Tuesday hackers exploited a bug in its email server software and used it to attack the company's exchange email service. Microsoft blamed the breach on China, calling it a highly skilled and sophisticated state-sponsored operation. The tech company says the hackers are trying to steal information from various targets, including American universities, law firms and research centers that study infectious diseases. Microsoft also added the China-based group operates from leased U.S. service to help them avoid detection, but noted the hack doesn't affect personal email accounts or Microsoft's cloud-based services. Microsoft credits Virginia-based cybersecurity firm Volexity with detecting the intrusion. They say their monitor picked up a suspiciously large data transfer in late January. Microsoft has released a security update to fix the problem on its Exchange server. The CCP's grip on scientists from outside China may be tighter than ever before. Early last year, Dr. Anthony Fauci's deputy was required to sign a confidentiality agreement tailored to China's terms. He signed it so that he could join a World Health Organization, or WHO, team in China. The team was there to collect data about the CCP virus. Dr. Fauci is the chief medical advisor to the U.S. president and also the director of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. According to an email from last February, a WHO officer informed Fauci's deputy, Cliff Lane, that he would have to sign a confidentiality form approved by Chinese authorities. The WHO officer wrote, quote, the forms this time are tailored to China's terms, so we cannot use the ones from before. Lane was also asked to complete a disclosure of interest form. The Daily Caller News Foundation obtained the email through a lawsuit filed by a watchdog group called Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch's president said in a statement, these new emails show WHO and Fauci's special accommodations to Chinese communist efforts to control information about COVID-19. It is not clear what restrictions Beijing included in the confidentiality form. The Chinese communist regime has maintained a tight grip on both Chinese and foreign scientists studying the virus. CCP officials have been accused of silencing doctors, whistleblowers and journalists who tried to alert the public in the early stage of the pandemic. Beijing delayed a WHO visit to Wuhan last month aimed at investigating the origins of the virus. The CCP also refused to turn over raw data on early virus patients in Wuhan. Many Chinese people have to face strict lockdown restrictions that are supposed to keep them safe. But some people lost their lives not because of the virus, but because of the lockdown. NTD's Becky Zhou has the details. A longer-than-expected lockdown in one Chinese city is driving residents over the edge. 
Locals report having no choice but to watch their family members die due to a lack of public services. Since the beginning of the lockdown, Nangong City has reduced emergency services provided by police, firemen, and nurses. At least three residents there recently passed away. They were not infected with the CCP virus. My father has been lying on the street unattended for some time due to the lockdown. By the time we knew that, it was too late to rescue him. And when she called 110, the emergency number in China, the operator said the police and firemen couldn't do anything due to the lockdown. Mr. Sun explained it's been hard for him to visit his parents because every village is under lockdown. Sun's father passed away on the eve of Chinese New Year because he couldn't get medical attention in time. His mother was also sickened while mourning for her husband, but the ambulance that was called for her arrived late. She was pronounced dead shortly after arriving at the hospital. In another similar case, a man from the same city also passed away. My elder brother became sick around 1.30 a.m. on January 28th. My sister-in-law dialed 120 and 110, but to no avail, then called the Chinese hospital emergency hotline. The staff said they couldn't come because they only have one vehicle. The hospital later announced that Mr. Shen's brother died of heart failure. The hospital staff sent his body directly to the funeral home without first getting permission from the family. Reporting by Becky Joe, NTD News. Pineapples are now at the center of the latest Taiwan-China dispute. After an abrupt import ban by Communist China, Taiwan surprisingly sold more pineapples within days than it did during the entire year of 2020. U.S. and Canadian diplomats praised the taste of pineapples grown in Taiwan Tuesday. It comes after Beijing banned pineapple imports from Taiwan last week, saying they could have harmful creatures on them. But Taiwan says the ban is a political move to put pressure on the island. We want China to know that political pressure could not damage pineapples, neither could it reduce pineapple sweetness. China accounts for 90 percent of Taiwan's pineapple exports. To address the surplus, Taiwan's foreign minister is calling on the world to rally behind the hashtag Freedom Pineapple. The de facto U.S. embassy in Taiwan asked, have you bought your pineapples yet? We have. And it posted pictures of pineapples with the hashtags Real Friends, Real Progress and Pineapple Solidarity. And the director of Canada's trade office posted a picture of his breakfast with the hashtag Freedom Pineapple. In recent months, China has repeatedly sent fighter jets into Taiwan airspace as a message. Beijing still considers Taiwan a part of China. The Chinese regime has a record of using agricultural imports to achieve its policy goals. For example, to retaliate against Australia's hard stance on Beijing, China put a 200 percent tariff on Australian wine last November. One Hudson Institute fellow tweets, Nothing pairs nicely with an Australian wine like a Taiwanese pineapple cake. Tastes like freedom and a Japanese YouTuber made a creative video promoting Taiwan's pineapples. According to Taiwan authorities, more than 41,000 tons of pineapples have been sold since China's ban last Friday. That's about the same amount exported to China last year, and exports to Japan have reached a record high. Reporting by Lin Lin, NTD News. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is showing her support for Uyghur Muslims, an ethnic minority persecuted by the Chinese communist regime. On Monday, Pelosi met with U.S.-based Uyghur rights group Campaign for Uyghurs, or CFU. It's a nonprofit that advocates for the freedoms and rights of the Uyghur people globally. During the virtual meeting, Pelosi reiterated her view that the U.S. has an obligation to address the human rights abuses. She also wrote on Twitter saying that if the U.S. doesn't speak out on rights abuses in China, then it loses its moral authority to speak out on human rights altogether. The next day, the Chinese regime's foreign ministry slammed the meeting and denied any abuses against the Uyghurs. The regime's spokesperson also discredited CFU members. Contrary to the regime's denial, the UN has said that the CCP holds one million Uyghurs in Xinjiang's detention camps. Camp survivors and experts say that Uyghurs in Xinjiang have been subjected to systemic torture, forced sterilization, forced labor and political brainwashing. Leaked documents from the regime also show the same. Jack Ma, the founder of the Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba, has lost his title as China's richest man. Ma held the title since 2019, but according to the 2021 Huron Global Rich List, he is now trailing in fourth place. 
He is right behind the founder of another Chinese e-commerce company. His fall comes after Chinese regulators reined in Ma's ant group and Alibaba on antitrust issues. Last October, Ma blasted China's regulatory system. And that led in part to the suspension of his ant group's nearly $40 billion IPO just days before the public listing. Following Ma's criticism, Chinese regulators have tightened antitrust scrutiny on the tech sector. Right now, the title of China's richest man belongs to Zhong Shanshan. He has $85 billion in personal wealth and is the founder of a bottled water company. The second richest man is the CEO of Chinese tech giant Tencent. He has $74 billion in personal wealth. Tencent developed the messaging app WeChat. It has about 20 million active daily users in the U.S. Jack Ma currently sits with $56 billion. Behind Ma in fifth place is the founder of TikTok's Bike Dance. He has $54 billion. As of 2020, TikTok has more than 100 million active monthly users in the U.S. Both TikTok and WeChat have been under scrutiny by the Trump administration. That's due to national security concerns. Trump proposed a ban on both apps. The Commerce Department under Trump has said that the apps collect personal information from users. And that data could be sent to the Chinese Communist Party. Last week, the Biden administration asked the U.S. Court of Appeals to pause Trump's ban on WeChat and TikTok. In communist China, authorities will charge someone for so-called speech crimes about every two days. That's according to a list a Chinese citizen compiled. The list tallies every time Chinese authorities punished or censored someone for the person's speech. It covers the past eight years. But it only records cases that have been made known to the public. Although the list does not include cases that occurred behind closed doors, it still has more than 1,800 entries. That means a case of censorship happens on average every 40 hours for the past eight years. From the listed cases, it appears that any form of criticism towards the regime may be subject to censorship or punishment. That's because the list includes people who got censored for questioning the news, insulting the CCP and its members, insulting CCP leaders Xi Jinping and Mao Zedong, arguing against the police, questioning the official data on the CCP virus in Wuhan, questioning the official death toll from the border clash with India, questioning the party's policies, talking about quitting the CCP, and talking about the spiritual practice Falun Gong. In one seemingly trivial case, someone was even punished for writing a dirty joke online. The person behind the list is known only as Mr. Wang. He says he decided to compile the list after reading about people who were punished for so-called insulting the country. He writes on Twitter saying he knew there are speech crimes in China, but never thought they are this bad. He adds, quote, Big Brother is watching you. I tried to look for the eyes of Big Brother and ended up finding them everywhere. When we talk about freedom of speech in China, people may think of the Chinese regime's crackdown on dissidents and internet censorship, blocking its citizens from seeing anything that criticizes the communist system. Some attribute the lack of free speech to China's thousands of years under an imperial system. The Communist Party regularly echoes that China's old world culture ought to be destroyed, something it says makes way for paradise under communism. But a glance at the country's history may prove free speech does have roots there. China's homegrown free speech tradition dates back thousands of years and is actually anchored in Confucianism. Visitors to Tiananmen Square in Beijing will probably notice a tall ceremonial column there. It's made of white marble, decorated with delicate carvings and features a mythical creature on top. The column, known as Hua Biao, actually originated from Fei Bang Mu. Loosely translated, it means commentary board. It refers to wooden boards that were often set up on main roads. They gave the public a place to write criticism and complaints about government policies. It first appeared 5,000 years ago during the time of ancient Emperor Shun. The idea was often cited by later scholars and officials, mainly to persuade emperors to take criticism from the public into account. The idea of criticizing rulers can also be seen in Confucius classes. Contrary to the absolute obedience required by the current-day Communist Party, a disciple of Confucius named Mencius once argued before a king that people should not be silent when their ruler makes major mistakes. Instead, they should forcefully voice their concerns. 
He went on to say that if the leader still refuses to listen after the people have repeatedly raised the issue, they should either remove that ruler from power or abandon the state. The right to criticize the emperor was later incorporated into the Chinese imperial system. During the 7th century's Sui and later Tang dynasties, China established a political system called the Three Departments and Six Ministries. Under the system, the Department of State Affairs is the executive branch. The Secretariat advises the emperor and drafts the policies, similar to modern legislature. While the chancellery reviews those policies and decides if they're legitimate, if the chancellery decides the policies is inappropriate, they can refuse to co-sign the bill. Without their signature, the policy cannot be legally implemented. There could be back and forth between the emperor and the consulary. But according to Taiwan-based China history scholar Ma Han Kuang, the emperor couldn't do much, aside of removing the official who disagrees. But that would be seen as a drastic move and considered disrupting the legal system. No Tang Dynasty emperor ever took that route. Most dynasties in ancient China also created official positions, whose job was to criticize the emperor's decisions and block them from going into effect. It became an unwritten rule that throughout China's imperial system that the emperor could not punish or kill those officials over their criticism. If they did, the emperor would risk losing their claim to power and ruin their reputation in history. The founder and first emperor of the Song dynasty demanded that his successor never kill those who criticized the emperor. He said if anyone who came later were to violate the rule, that person should be destroyed by heaven. Thanks to the systematic protection of those officials and moral restrictions on the emperor, many officials from the Tang and Song dynasties became well known for their honest yet blunt criticism. One of them from the early Tang dynasty named Wei Zhen often got into heated debates with Emperor Taizong. The emperor was at times spotted retreating to an inner hall and heard cursing aloud, someday I'm going to kill that hillbilly. But he never did. Instead, Wei was treated with great respect. When he passed away, the emperor wept. He said using other people's opinion as a mirror, one may correctly weigh gains and losses. Now Wei Jin has died and we have lost a mirror. Another Tang Dynasty emperor, Xianzong, also expressed similar thoughts toward his official, saying that he promoted him to the position and even though he's so impolite to me, there is nothing I can do. There were dynasties and emperors in China that historically punished critics. But their inability to take criticism was often cited as one of the main reasons for their demise. The checks and balances in the three department system was later referenced by Sun Yixian, who established China's first democratic government in 1912. Even though the protection of the official critics was not written into law in ancient China, records show it was often more effective than in modern China under communist rule. Now, free speech exists in the country's constitution, but isn't really practiced. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.